Hello, this is Andy from the Engineers Academy and today we're going to begin looking at static engineering systems. Now before we do that, I'm just going to begin with an example of a dynamic engineering system just to help you to understand some of the concepts that we're going to be discussing later on in this video. So a dynamic engineering system is a system which involves movement. And I want you to imagine that in the centre of the page here, we have a snooker ball. Now if that snooker ball is acted on by two forces simultaneously, so if a force is applied to the snooker ball here, and a force is applied here at the same time, then what we'll end up with is that snooker ball is going to travel in a direction. And hopefully you can see that that snooker ball would actually travel in this direction here. Now the reason for that is because these two forces can be replaced with the single force or the resultant force shown in blue. So if we call our first force F1 and we call our second force F2, we can actually replace forces F1 and F2 with a resultant force R. I guess what we're really saying is that the force R is equivalent to the forces F1 and F2. The reason I start with a dynamic system is because this is something we can visualise. So the two forces might be applied in different directions. So this time, if we take our snooker ball and we have a force being applied here and we have a force being applied here, then that snooker ball might travel in this direction. But again, our resultant force can be used to replace the first two forces, F1 and F2. So now let's use what we know there and apply it to a static engineering system. So a static engineering system is one where there's no movement. Essentially what we're saying is that the forces within the system are balanced. There's no net force acting on the system. So what we have on the left hand side of the screen here, I want you to imagine that this is a supporting column. It's connected to the ground at the bottom and it's connected to the ceiling at the top, but it's being used to support the structure. We can still apply two forces to that. We can have a force being applied from left to right and a force being applied from front to back, like so. And on the right hand side of the screen, I've actually drawn a plan view of that column. So that column has got the force going left to right and the force going front to back. Once again, we'll call them F1 and F2. Now, when those two forces are applied to that column, we're still going to end up with a resultant force in this direction. Now normally if we have a resultant force that object would be moving or it would be accelerating but in the case of a static engineering system as well as the resultant what we end up with is an equal and opposite force which is called the equilibrium. So here we have F1 and F2 causing a resultant force R but we have an equilibrium force which balances that resultant or cancels it out. The net result of that is that the sum of the forces in the system equals zero. There's no net force acting. The object isn't moving. So the question is, in this system, where does the equilibrium force come from? And the answer, hopefully you can see, is that if we have a resultant force acting on the object, the equilibrium force is going to come from the supports at the top and bottom of the pillar. How they're distributed will depend on at what height F1 and F2 are applied, but the supports provide the equilibrium force. So the important things to remember, first of all, in a dynamic system, we have movement. We have a net force acting on an object, which causes it to accelerate in a given direction. But in a static engineering system, there is no net force. The sum of the forces equals zero. So we can still determine the resultant force, which will be as a result of the forces that we're applying to the object. But that resultant force is going to be balanced by an equilibrium force, which is going to come about as a result of supports, or other structures preventing that object from moving. So let's take a similar example. We have an object that's being acted on by two forces, and those two forces are the same size. We've got one force, F1, acting this way, and we've got a second force, F2, acting this way. If we want to determine the resultant force acting on that object, then what we need to do is something called vector addition. Now it's probably worth mentioning that the forces are vectors. And vectors are things that have both a magnitude and a direction. Okay, so a vector has a magnitude plus a direction. So if we think of a force, the force is going to have a magnitude or a size, but it also has a direction, left to right, bottom to top, 45 degrees. It will always have a direction. 
the difference or the alternative is something called a scalar and scalars don't have a direction they only have a magnitude so to give you an example of a scalar something like the volume of an object would be an example of a scalar it has a physical quantity but it doesn't have a direction that that physical quantity acts in other examples of vectors are things like velocities and accelerations as we'll see in later tutorials so what we need to do in order to find our resultant force is something called vector addition and the way that we add vectors is by adding those vectors one onto the other or end on end and by end on end I mean we would take our first force F1 we would add our second force onto the end of F1 like so and the resultant would be the single force that joins the start to the end so the start of F1 to the end of F2 would be our resultant I guess the other thing that's important to point out here is it doesn't actually matter which way round we add our vectors. We could just have easily have added F2 first, and then we could have added F1 to the end of F2. And what you'll notice is that the start and end point don't change. And because the start and end point don't change, the resultant force is the same. You've probably already noticed that when we do this, we produce triangles. So this is very much reliant on us being able to use trigonometry and Pythagoras' theorem, which you would have learned in a previous tutorial. So let's look at another couple of examples just to help you understand this concept. Let's take another object. And this time we're going to have three forces acting on it. We're going to have a force F1. We're going to have a force F2. And then we're going to have a third force, F3, acting downwards. Now it makes no difference that this is a pulling force rather than a pushing force. It's still acting on that object in the downwards direction. So I could just have easily have drawn it up here with the arrowhead here. It's still a force acting downwards. Now if I want to find the resultant of these three vectors, what I would need to do is I would need to take F1. I would need to add F2. And finally, I would need to add F3, end on end, as mentioned previously. And the resultant is the single force that joins the start of that vector diagram to the end of that vector diagram. And as mentioned earlier, our equilibrium force would be the same size but acting in the opposite direction. Also, as mentioned before, it doesn't matter which order I add these forces in. So I'm going to begin this time with F3. And then I'm going to add F1 to that. And then I'm going to add F2 to that. And what we'll find if we drew this to scale is that that resultant would be in exactly the same direction and exactly the same size. So providing we add the forces end on end, we won't have any issues with defining our resultant. But what we need to be able to do is assess this using trigonometry. So it's an analytical method rather than a graphical method which will give us much more accurate results. So let's take a simple example to begin with. We have our object and this time it's going to be acted on by two forces. I'm going to take one force here which I'm going to call F1. I'm going to take a second force here which I'm going to call F2. Now if I want to find the resultant of those two forces, first of all I'll need to know this angle. Let's call that 45 degrees for simplicity. And I want to add those two vectors together to find my resultant. So first of all, I have F2 here. Next, I have F1 here. And I want to find the length R. But I also want to find this angle, which I'm going to call theta. Because to fully define that resultant, I need to define the magnitude and I need to define the direction because it's a vector. So the method we'll be using when we look at some specific examples is we're going to turn that F1 into a right angle triangle. We're going to find this distance here, which we'll be calling F1x because it's the x component. And we'll be finding this distance here, which we're going to call F1y because it's the y component. And by doing so, we're going to end up with a new triangle. I'm going to redraw this. This is our new triangle. This is our resultant that we're trying to find. This is our angle theta that we want to find. But 
this length here is going to be f2 plus f1x. We can see that from the diagram below. We've got f2 from there to there, and we've got f1x from there to there. And the vertical is going to be f1y. Now the reason why it's only f1y and not f1y plus something to do with f2 is because f2 only has a horizontal component. It doesn't have a vertical component. There's no part of f2 to add on to that vertical component. So now we have a triangle. We can use Pythagoras' theorem to find our r value. And then we can use trigonometry to find our theta value. I'm just going to run through one more example. And this time, neither of my forces are going to be either horizontal or vertical. So I'm going to have my object. I'm going to have a force acting this way. And then I'm going to have a larger force acting this way. Now, if I want to find the resultant of these two vectors, I can start with a sketch. I'm going to take F1, my first force. Let's call that one F1 and that one F2. And I'm going to add to that my second force, F2. And I want to determine my resultant force, R. Now let's just take a look about what we know about F1 and F2. Well, F1 is going to have an X component and a Y component. So if we turn that into a right angle triangle, we'll be able to find F1X and we'll be able to find F1Y. But let's look more closely at F2. F2 also has an X component and a Y component. The X component we're going to call F2X and the Y component we're going to call F2Y. Now this time, the bigger triangle is this one here. I'm just going to draw that bigger triangle again just so we can remove some of these labels. So we've got our resultant R. We want to know what this length here is. We want to know what this length here is because then we can determine R and we can determine the angle theta. Well, this bottom edge is just going to be F1x plus F2x. The reason being is because F1x gets us from there to there, and F2x gets us from there to there. So on the bottom of our new triangle, this is going to be F1x plus F2x, which we can determine through trigonometry. And our vertical is going to be F1y plus F2y. And again, the reason for that is F1y is going to get us from here to here, and F2y gets us from here to here. So it gives us the total length of that side of the triangle. We're going to look at some specific examples of these. It was more to help you to understand the concepts behind what we're going to be doing in the next video, where we're going to look at the application of this method of vector addition.